First up, Stanlib's Global Bond Fund aims to provide an attractive income with the possibility of capital growth by investing in a diversified international portfolio of government and non-government bonds. The non-government portion of the portfolio includes bonds issued by government agencies and supranational entities, which are international organizations formed by two or more governments. The fund recently won a Raging Bull Award and head of Stanlib's retail investing, Paul Hansen, joins us in studio to tell us more. Well, Paul, let's start with what the Stanlib Global Bond Fund is doing differently to its peer group, having just won the Raging Bull Award. And secondly, what is causing the outperformance? Pardon well, the fund, we handed over the management of the fund about two and a half years ago to a company called Brandywine Investment Management. Fascinating name. Brandywine. Brandywine. One, uh, one word. Over in the US, they uh, have, be, have been voted the top global bond fund manager a couple of years ago. And they, uh, they take quite big bets. You know, they've managed this fund extremely well, taking large bets both on allocation to bonds and on currency allocation. And, you know, currency... Well, currency is so volatile. That's yeah. a, a difficult allocation to make yeah. in, at the end of the day. And it plays a big role in the performance of global bonds, currency management. So what they've done is they've, they've been very overweight in, in the U.S. bonds and in the U.S. dollar for the last pretty much two and a half years. It's a big bet. They've, they've had just about nothing in the euro and zero in the yen or in, in, in yen bonds, in Japanese bonds. So I mean, you're talking about 26% of the index, the Barclays Global Aggregate Index, is in European bonds and they hold about 6%. I think it's about 18% in Japanese bonds they hold zero. So they're taking huge bets. Now, what they do, they take a portion of that European, uh, what would have been European allocation, put it in emerging markets. So about 26% of the bond fund is invested in emerging market bonds, including about 3.5% in South African government bonds. Just talk, coming back to the U.S., have they maintained that position? Up until the end US of exposure? January. Yes, up until the end of January, which is the last information I've got, they were still very overweight, the dollar and also... U U.S. bonds. And underweight the, the European side of Very, things. very underweight the European and zero in the Japan. Let's look at that 35% allocation to emerging markets. Which emerging markets in particular are we talking about? Are we staying with Brazil, Russia, India, China? You've mentioned 3.5% allocation to South Africa. The two biggest are actually Malaysia, about 4.4%, and Hungary, 4.4%. So interesting there. Then 3.5% South Africa, some Brazil and a few others, so in the end, 26%. In terms of the split between government and non-government, is that easy for you to pull out? Yeah, they've got in pure government bonds, two-thirds, 66%, and then about another 10% in agencies, government agency bonds. So close to 76% in government or related, which is pretty high at this stage. Just generally, sentiment to government bonds going forward, given the financial fallout that we've seen globally, etc. Surely there, there's a little bit of uh, more skepticism when it comes to the government bond arena. Well, th there is, because largely because there's a feeling that there's so much money has gone into government bonds as an investment in the last three, four years, much more than into equities, even though equities have way outperformed government bonds since the turn in 2009. And because there's a wall of money has gone into those bonds, there's a fear. Is it sustainable? That, yeah, the question. exactly. A, is it sustainable? B, what happens when they start when it starts coming out? So the feeling is as long as the U.S. Has, has QE3 on the go and is therefore pushing down the yields, uh, you know, pumping $85 billion into buying bonds every month, and as long as the economy stay reasonably weak, there's no reason for bonds. So, so what would the red flag be to change the weighting and potentially go underweight bonds? I think once your U.S. unemployment gets down to 6.5%, uh, we're, I think it's 79 now, so if it gets down to six and a half and the Fed says, OK, no more QE3 and we're now going to start raising interest rates, that could be the end for bonds. Let's talk about uh, your fund, the International Aggressive Fund. What are you, how are you allocating at the moment? So I'm a little bit overweight equities. The benchmark is roughly around 70% in equities. I'm about 72, 73, so I'm, I'm slightly overweight. And then I've got 10 to 12% in global listed property as well, which, which are all list, also listed shares. So we're looking at about 84 percent in listed entities. <laughs> Would you deem that an aggressive position? Yeah, it is aggressive and that, going along with the name of the fund. 
Paul, what, what are you underweight on in terms of your international aggressive? Very underweight bonds. The benchmark's 15. We're about nine and a half. So we're following that on the bond side. So you're not taking a cue from the, <laughs> the global <laughs> bond fund. I, I can see some interesting well, uh, scenarios are, being thrown around. Well, are performing. You see. So I want to be where the art performance is. And, and global property in particular has outperformed equities for almost four years now as well. Your exposure on the equity front, can you give me a little more color there? Yeah, I'm, at the moment, I'm, a little, I'm quite f full in the US. I mean, you're talking about, you know, f uh, 46, 47% in the US as far as the investments go. But I, but I also have uh, a good allocation to emerging markets, which have so far underperformed this year. You know, the, the benchmark is 13%, and I've got closer to 20%. So Are you following that bond fund in terms of Malaysia and Hungary, those allocations at 4.4%? No, I'm not, because I use, at the moment, I'm using Fidelity funds, and uh, they don't have individual country funds like that. They've got an emerging market bond fund. Do you believe that the value is to be found in international equities over local equities at this point? Yes, I think, uh, I think there is more value there, and there's more scope, there's more choice, and you know, they, they, where they were 13 years ago, the, the, the MSCI World Index, yeah. Let's get your thoughts on the local equity front then. Do you think that we are in for a pullback given the, the good performance that we've seen to date? Although in general, we're, we're not seeing the JSE all share looking too expensive on a like-for-like -like basis. Yeah, it looks, you know, it looks fairly valued. It doesn't look like it's got a lot, of, a lot more upside, but at the same time, we will follow the offshore markets to an extent and the, and the bull market remains intact. And we may already have had our pullback. <laughs> well, when we come back to the international environment, sectoral bias, do you have one? We, um, we, we, are, we like financials, we're a little bit underweight there. We overweight IT, a little bit overweight resources, but it's small in offshore markets, and like the industrial shares, generally. In the South African space, would you be playing the industrial shares still? Yeah. You know, you, I mean, yesterday we had three record highs from British American Tobacco and breweries and Nuspers. You can't ignore them. You know, the Rand hedges uh, and. But the you, would you would you advise people to put new money into those shares? Very cautiously, because they've had huge runs. Exactly. <laughs> they, I mean, they're trading at all, all time highs, they aren't are. they? They've had massive runs, so hard to buy them now there's no question maybe british american tobacco but some of the others are quite steep the other debate that i've had on the desk of late is around the the retailers uh, still obviously in the industrial space and that's your your shop rights your truest foreshini etc etc would you still be playing those stocks or do you think that we are in for a pullback i was chatting to alvin van der Merwe from sunlam private investments yesterday and he was anticipating or throwing forward to a potential pullback in those retailers well, they're already, I think they're at a six month or five month low, so they have pulled back quite a bit. However, we, uh, our house view at Stanley is that certain shares like Woolies, Mr. Price, in particular, are long term inclusions in the portfolio. We just think we like those companies, we like their management, we like what they're doing. So, irrespective of a pullback, and it could, be, could be go further, we like the companies very much. Resource stocks, Paul, in, on the local front, would you be playing into them right now? Very, very difficult one because it's been so disappointing, you know, negative so far this year, poor last year. So, you know, I think, you know, we like Bulletin in particular. We know we're very underweight relative to the benchmark of about 28% of the all share index. You know, one's hoping that they'll turn a bit, they behaving badly though. Uh, let's talk about the, the changes that we've seen in top management across the, the mining companies. Uh, pretty much all the majors have seen a management change and we're moving from the CEOs effectively that took them through the global financial crisis. Is it a theme that you've been following? Do you think new management can breathe new life into these stocks and specifically you mentioned BHP Billiton? Well, I'm certainly hope, hoping for Anglo in particular, because <laughs> that one's been the worst of the lot, I think. Do you think Kutafani can make a change? He's very highly regarded uh, from people within the industry, which is a good sign. And so I think he can, you know, um, I, I think he can. I honestly do, and uh, only the future will tell, but he's got the ingredients. He's got the necessary ingredients to do that and the experience. Considering we're doing a, a little catch up on all the sectors uh, on the JSC all share, what about the construction space? So the, the value managers are saying that this is firmly the time to, to buy. Obviously, a lot of them have been early into construction stocks. We've just come through the budget. We've seen the commitment on the, the infrastructure spend side. Would you be buying furiously into construction plays? <laughs> 
They are looking very interesting. If you look at the charts, the breaks of trend of some of them like Group 5. And, you know, it looks like downside risk, very limited. Upside potential, quite decent. So although you can't actually see the spend going on yet in South Africa, I think you have to, you have to somehow be a believer. But it's not just here. It's Africa and some of them are a bit of Australia and the Middle East. So I, I do. I, not, not big gung-ho, but moderately. Financials. Let's not leave the financials out. Any appetite for banks at the moment on your front? Well, it's interesting. You've got Standard Bank trading where it was five and a half years ago. You know, even before the Chinese bought 20 percent. It's below where the Chinese, when the Chinese came in. You know, so they come out with the results on Thursday. And we know they're meant to be around about 10, 11, 12 percent up. But it'll be interesting to see, you know, what they actually, uh, what they actually come out, the detail of it. It'll be very interesting because first trade was tremendous today, better than expected. And you know, their share's been great, but for, uh, Standard Bank ain't gone anywhere for a while. 